thanks, uh, Richard, for inviting me uh, to this and uh, for everyone for attending. Seems like a great group. I wish I could uh, join in person. Uh, this is a presentation about the Pi Finder. Hopefully by the end of it, you'll understand what that is. Um, I'm also Richard, uh, an amateur astronomer, software engineer, and hardware tinkerer. Uh, my interests run through portable computers, weird form factors, and special purpose kind of devices. Uh, and that's uh, what kind of launched me on this, this journey here. Uh, that's me in the middle there with a telescope and a couple other uh, bits and pieces that I've I've created before the Pi Finder. Um, so what what is this thing? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, and then I'll get into why it, it exists. But um, it is a self-contained device built on a Raspberry Pi that has a camera and uh, other bits and pieces to let people figure out where their telescope is pointed and to find objects in the night sky. Uh, so the hardware is kind of listed there and, you know, feel free to ask any questions about it there. Um, uh, do I not have my video going too? So sorry about that. Yeah, your video's on. I yeah. think I have my video. Yeah, okay. Yeah, your video's on. Um, so it's a video for everyone. Great. Message for everyone. Oh. So we're going to turn on their video. So, so we're not. No, it's okay. I thought I had neglected that, uh, that point. Um, great. So, uh, some hardware, custom printed circuit board to kind of bring everything together, but it plugs into the Pi as a hat, some 3D printed enclosure, um, a bunch of Python software to run the OLED display and the keypad. Uh, it's multi threaded to interface with the GPS and the inertial measurement unit and the camera and so forth. Um, so, all of this stuff uh, is the end result of a sort of dream I had, um, but I know this isn't really an astronomy group. So I thought I'd take a minute just to talk about why these sorts of devices exist on telescopes to give a bit more background about why I made some of these choices and started on this journey. Uh, so what's so hard about pointing a telescope? You're out there with the telescope, there's stars in the sky, moving the telescope around. Well, um, it's vast and it's complicated. The sky changes every night. Uh, changes throughout the year. Um, most of the things you're looking for are very small and very dim, so you can't actually see them with with the naked eye. Um, as a good example, the human eye has a you know field of view of maybe a hundred degrees with some peripheral. Um, but most telescopes are looking at just a small little fraction of that, just just one degree. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, here's uh, the night sky. You might recognize. Uh, the Big Dipper there and Polaris. Uh, if we go a little bit further, you'll see that I've zoomed in a little bit to a 60 degree field of view and you can probably still recognize the constellation. Uh, if not, here's a slightly more zoomed in with the constellation kind of drawn. And in this area right up here is a galaxy, pretty well known galaxy, fairly large, fairly bright, but you know, no way to see it. Um, if we Continue zooming in and keep going. You can just see the faintest hint of it here. Uh, again, we're between those those two bright stars. I know this is dim because that's kind of how it how it looks. Um, oh, sorry, I think I might have just lost my screen share there. Are we? Sorry, are we back to that? So I gotta find that one more time. Okay, there we go. Back on track. <laughs> um, yes, great. So uh, now we're at a three degree field of view and uh, you can start to see that galaxy still fairly small. And finally, this is sort of what you might see half a degree through the IP. So, as you can imagine, it, it's, it's fairly difficult to do this. Uh, if you have a really good knowledge of the night sky, you can use the star patterns to sort of point your way around. Uh, but especially for beginners, it can be very difficult. And even in this little slice of sky, this is three degrees, you can see all these different little objects, some of which are much smaller even. 
than this uh, fairly well-known pinwheel galaxy. So pointing a telescope is difficult. Um, feel free to jump in with any questions there before I move on. Okay. So the current solution uh, looks a lot like this. Uh, you put rotary encoders, quadrature encoders on uh, the altitude axis, so the up and down axis of your telescope, the azimuth or the sort of left and right. Um, often that involves a lot of cables. And all that really tells you is where the telescope is pointed relative to the Earth's reference frame. So in order to make sense of that and point you at the sky, uh, you need to go ahead and point the telescope at known objects in the sky, a couple of them. And then there's a mathematical model, which is instantiated in a device like this. And this is a great device, the Nexus DSC. Um, and once you get that all done, it will tell you where it thinks your telescope is pointing. But it's an inferred position. Um, sorry, I'm just going to actually switch here. I'm trying to juggle back and forth between a couple different monitors, and it's not working well. Um, so let's see, it must be a real challenge. Yes, I'll talk about uh, the challenge of that in a moment. Uh, so, yes. Um, so it instantiates the model of the sky. That model is as good as your encoders are and as good as the orthogonality of your telescope's pointing system. And as you're moving the scope left and right, if you miss a, a tick from an encoder somewhere, you're just gonna kind of accumulate error and there's no way that this fantastic device, which is telling you where in the sky you're pointed, has any idea of that. So eventually you have to realign it. This happens several times throughout the evening. And if you expect to see something and it's not there, well, you're not really sure. Is your computer off a little bit? Is, is half a degree of error is enough to miss something completely? So I was in this world for a bit. Um, I used this exact device on my telescope here. Um, but it was a kind of a kludge. Here you can see the way that I ended up having to attach my encoders because uh, I don't actually have a pivot point for either the altitude or the azimuth. You can see that it's uh, sort of hollow there. Um, sorry, let's see. Uh, so this didn't work as well as it even could have. So it, it's a little bit of a problematic, uh, difficult uh, situation. And with the way that I had it going, it just wasn't really accurate enough to, to satisfy me. So I started thinking about what would be something that could do the same stuff, but sort of from first, first principle there. Um, first and foremost, I wanted more observing time. So I didn't want to deal with alignment and I just wanted smoother operation. Um, I don't get a lot of time out under the stars. As uh, acknowledged in the chat, Los Angeles isn't a great place. So I have to drive someplace much darker. Um, so I don't get a lot of time. I want to use it the best that I can. And I wanted to know if I looked in the eyepiece and I didn't see the galaxy I was expecting, is that because I'm in the wrong place? Or is that just because my particular uh, skills are not up to the task? I also wanted uh, something that was night vision friendly so I didn't upset my fellow uh, astronomy enthusiasts. Uh, customizable would be great. I like to hack at things. It's kind of my, my reason. And some, a lot of these de devices are closed source. Um, I wanted to be able to record my observations instead of having to go to a separate sheet of paper. Um, and I thought it would be a fun and interesting project. So I started doing some research. What could this look like? Um, there's been some, some work on plate solving, which is taking a photograph of the night sky and figuring out where uh, that is oriented. There's a couple different techniques for that, but it seemed mature enough and it gave a direct reading of where the telescope is pointed rather than this indirect inference. So I decided that's what I wanted to aim for. Um, but the issue with that is it, it only tells you where the telescope is pointing when it's stationary. If you're moving, it's motion blurred. Uh, it's not gonna get enough data. So I thought I'd kind of try to marry that with an accelerometer. So as you're moving the telescope, it could give you an estimate when you stop, it would go ahead and correct that with the next uh, photograph of the night sky. And plate solving, I wanted some catalog search. Uh, I wanted what's called push to guidance, which is the ability to have the, the computer tell you 
which direction to move the scope. It's kind of like having a motorized scope, except you're the motor. You see, you just take instructions from the computer uh, to find what you want. Um, GPS is helpful for all of this. It's sort of an enabling technology. And of course, I wanted observation logging. Um, I love programming in Python. That's kind of my bread and butter for my day job. So it was going to be written in Python. Um, I decided it needed to be multi-threaded because it has to do all of this stuff. And hey, the Raspberry Pi has a couple CPUs. Wanted to take advantage of those. Um, I found this great library from the European Space Agency that can do a very fast pattern matching on stars to let you know where uh, where you are. It's designed for pointing uh, satellites, kind of uh, an homage there to the ISS, um, and Skyfield for astrom uh, astrometric conversions between different things. Um, this is the hardware I came up with, and I kind of went to town from there. Uh, the hardware development kind of looked like this. I ordered a couple batches of printed circuit boards. Um, I'd done similar keyboard type stuff before, so I had that pretty well nailed. Um, the screen integration, uh, the GPIO header there, um, you know, eventually a screen and a nice sort of like other printed circuit board for legends. Uh, here you can see the camera, some of the early 3D printed parts. And, uh, you know, this is the backside showing the camera with some uh, ability to, to control how it's pointed so it can be aligned with a telescope. Uh, this was sort of version one, it worked. I took this out under the stars and started working on some software. I did some uh, mock-ups, kind of thinking about what that small 128 by 128 screen was really capable of. Um, started coding that in Python. And that brought me to uh, the initial release. I decided pretty early on that I wanted to share this uh, through GitHub as open source. I do that with a lot of my projects. Uh, so this was my first sort of open source hardware and software kind of married together. Uh, the initial release looked just like this. Um, people could print it. Um, it had most of the major functions, positioning, catalog searching, push to guidance, uh, both as this sort of numeric display move left one degree, move up 1.3 degrees, and also uh, a real-time star chart with the target marked and uh, the current pointing position. So you could kind of do it either way. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, and since then, it's taken off. Uh, that was about a year ago. Uh, it'll be a year on October 2nd. And this is what the current uh, Pi Finder looks like. Um, some improvements, a backlit keypad, that was strikingly obvious the first time I took it out to use it uh, under the, the dark sky. Um, I can't believe it took me that actual uh, effort uh, to drive to a dark spot to realize that it was just illegible. Um, so backlit keyboard was great. Um, some community members came in and they uh, gave some great suggestions for simplifying the 3D printed parts so that it can be built either left-handed or right-handed. Telescopes come in a different, a couple different flavors. So uh, that's great. Adjustable mount. Uh, I had a bunch of different types of hardware, some M3, some M2.5, some M2 hardware. That was ridiculous. It's all M2.5 now. Um, and then a flat version to round out the sort of offerings here. Uh, tons of software improvements. Uh, community member is the first uh, person to join in. Uh, rightfully suggested that I need some linting uh, and some code quality. Uh, tools. So we, we decided on black as a Python formatter. Uh, the One of the first contributions was hardware abstraction. So it can be run on a PC, uh, a OS X or Windows. Um, we had a Wi-Fi access point, integration with specific telescope pointing uh, protocols, switched over to a, a more uh, open source friendly GPS system, lots more catalogs, just so many UX improvements. Um, and almost all of that has been uh, effort from community members. Um, I you know, have chipped in where I can, but making this open source has just been one of the, the best decisions that I think I could have made in this. And it's really evolved enormously uh, through that time. So this is a, a little bit about that, uh, that year. So uh, October 2nd was my initial Git commit. Um, that wasn't the initial release, that was some of the prototype stuff. Um, I gave a presentation similar to this to my local astronomy club. 
uh, about the project. It was pretty much working at that point, kind of, maybe, sort of, uh, but it was enough that people got excited about it. Um, I initially, uh, I, I officially launched it, the open source project, the full repo with a working version, the initial version on March 1st with a, a cloudy nights, which is an astronomy uh, specific sort of discussion forum. And of course, Reddit, because everyone loves Reddit. Um, and then March 10th, I sold the first unit. And I wasn't really expecting to, to sell units. Um, I thought people would just build them themselves. But one of my club members came to me and said, I can't, uh, I can't build this. Can you build one for me? And I said, sure, I'll charge you parts and, you know, a little bit of time enough for a six pack of beer or something. Um, and that kind of then got me thinking about how to make this more available. Um, I launched a discord at the suggestion of, of one of the, the, the Reddit users, I think, um, on May 24th, the first collaborator committed codes. They did pull, uh, fork the repo, pull request. Um, and all along this time, I was demoing the unit. People were asking me like, oh, I can't find this part. Can you give me this part? I was like doing group buys where I'd get a couple people together and we'd kind of buy, uh, you know, five of the cameras and, you know, five of the screens and, you know, we'd get together and I'd kind of distribute those. Um, and it, it became clear and clear to me that although there's enormous amount of overlap between makers and tinkerers and amateur astronomers, that Venn diagram is not nearly as complete as I kind of thought from my experience and that there were a lot of people that wanted this uh, and they wanted some help, either a pre-built electronics board or 3D printed parts or some combination of those things like the hardware bagged up. So um, all along this time, I'm you know collaborating with folks, we're getting software improvements, people are remixing. This is kind of an interesting one in, in, a, in aluminum. Uh, so, Eventually, I launched a, a full website where people could buy kits, uh, got credit card processing, all that shenanigans. Uh, now, August 18th, we passed the 100 mark. Uh, most of those are community built. That's great. I've seen pictures of them, but people just you know looked at the open source designs and they built them, which was my original plan. Uh, some of these were kits that I, I helped sell and, and give to folks. Um, and now we're coming up on the one year anniversary. So at the one year mark, uh, 150 people in the Discord, not all that active, but a good chunk of core contributors that are suggesting features, discussing a uh, new direction. Um, I fulfilled 72 orders. A lot of those are, are very informal, you know, uh, kit orders and so forth, but I'm starting to see more people wanting fully assembled units again, because they may not be comfortable enough to even put together the kit parts. Um, three pretty active Git contributors, uh, 735 commits, uh, almost seven and a half thousand lines of code. Uh, and the way that the PyFinder works is it takes photos of the night sky and it figures out where you're pointing and it, uh, tells you then what the position of your telescope is. It does that pretty much every second. So, uh, over the course of the life of these you know, 100, 100 plus Pi Finders, um, and they're uh, observing and so forth, I'm reasonably certain that they have taken and solved well over 6 million uh, images of the night sky, um, which is pretty cool. The Tetra 3 folks um, estimated that maybe their software had run through a couple thousand images before that point, because uh, it's just not routinely to just keep taking photos of the sky. Uh, that was kind of fun, uh, helped them pressure test a few things and they've been great uh, working with us to improve that, uh, that code base. Um, so I'm gonna get on the questions in a bit and maybe a demo if people are interested in that. Um, but I thought it's pretty traditional to have a sort of lessons learned uh, section here. Um, I don't have a ton of insight here. Not because everything went really smoothly, because it didn't, um, but because I didn't really have a goal in mind. I wanted a Pi Finder. And if I built one for myself and it worked, that was great. I was ecstatic that first day when I put it on my telescope and I could replace my other system 
and it just told me where to push the telescope and I could look at stuff in the night sky. That's ultimately what I wanted. Um, secondary to that, I, I thought if people wanted to build them, that's great. I'd help support that. Um, so it's kind of grown from there organically. If I would have gone back in time, I probably would have thought much more carefully about what I was willing to invest and support here. Um, I'm, I love talking to people and I love getting Pi Finders built. If I would have really thought about that, I would have probably structured things differently. Discord earlier, better documentation earlier, like a lot of stuff that I feel like I'm playing catch up on almost constantly. But um, ultimately I just built something that I wanted to build and I was passionate about it and I talked to people about it and it resonated with them. And, you know, I don't know where it's going to go next, but I'm happy if it just, you know, is what it is um, ultimately. So um, with that said, you know, it's good to plan for some things. Uh, we're working on software release 1.7, pretty major rewrite of some of the, uh, the code related to catalogs and so forth. I'm working with the, the community members, the contributors on a kind of Q4 roadmap, what features we may want to implement. Um, I've decided to split the product into sort of two veins, the DIY version, which will continue to support. And I'm going to try to make that uh, cheaper, easier to build. It's always going to be there for anyone who's handy with a soldering iron and they just want to build one. That's fantastic. Um, but I think that there's also a need for something which is more user-friendly, frankly, um, a little more refined, something that people can buy. Hopefully it'll be cheaper than the DIY version because when you start manufacturing things, um, combining bits and pieces, uh, I, I hope that it can be offered at a lower cost. Uh, so these are some of the ideas that I have that I'll be working on over the next three months. Um, the DIY version, every single piece of it, you can see some of those pieces here. Uh, they're large, they're through hole, super easy to assemble, but not the cheapest option for most of these things. Um, you know, this IMU unit here, it's great. Um, I think it runs something like $35. The chip that's really running it is just a couple bucks. So, um, you know, building something that's surface mount that could be assembled by machine, uh, I think will ultimately get the price down significantly at the expense of human buildability, but the, the DIY version will always be there uh, for people that might want to, to take that route. Um, so good. That went fairly quickly. Hopefully not too quickly. Um, questions. Otherwise I can, I got a little video of like the, the device in action. I can do some walkthroughs. We can go through the build guide, uh, kind of wherever yeah. you want to take it. Yeah. A bit of walkthrough might be nice. Um, yeah. 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 You've got to show us it. Okay, let's let's see if this will if this will work. Actually, I think I have this here. Okay, so I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna have the audio here, but this is I went out and recorded this when I was out observing last time. So I will narrate. It's about four minutes. Hopefully, we'll uh, get through this without too much wrinkle. Can you uh, can you all see this here? Yeah. Okay. Great. So this is, uh, believe it or not, this is a pie finder at night. Uh, not a ton to see. Um, sorry, the resolution's a little low here. Yeah, okay. Um, it's showing me where it is in the sky, and it's currently solving. Here I am cycling through the uh, preview, the catalog. Uh, you can, eh, you can't really see it there. Sorry, it's very dim. Um, but there you go. So you can see I'm kind of zooming out. So this is the star chart. Uh, you can turn off the constellation lines, the reticle and so forth. In a second, I'm pretty sure I will actually move the telescope, which is more interesting. Um, okay, well, I guess I'm going to the catalog system first. You can kind of see how it's used there. Uh, the A button cycles through the, the different functions. Here you can see the star chart updating as I'm slewing the telescope. Uh, so that's where it's pointing at the sky. It's about um, about 15 frames a second. 
Uh, the display runs on SPI. So uh, it's, uh, it's not running through any of the graphics subsystems there. It's just raw uh, Raspbian light. Uh, and then the screen is driven just through uh, the SPI interface. Uh, here I am searching for an object. Uh, I think I'm gonna look for M57, maybe. You can see as I type, um, it is loading information. So you press F five, it's loading up information for M5, two, loading up information for M52. Um, oh, that's much sharper. Thank you, YouTube. Um, <laughs> so there you go. So you can kind of see the display. That's roughly the quality of it. Uh, you can scroll up and down. There's about 18,000 objects in there. Um, a lot of them are very obscure, very small. You would never see them with a telescope of any, any aperture that you're reasonably going to have. Um, but once you select something like M11, uh, you press enter and it will tell you where to move the telescope. So you can see I'm starting to, to move the telescope in azimuth. Uh, and the goal here is to get these to zero, zero. It means that you're right pointed uh, directly at that object. Um, so I don't know if we're going to see it here, but when you move the telescope, the accelerometer is taking the last guaranteed known position from the photograph of the sky and it's kind of accumulating uh, motion when you stop it will take another photo and it will correct any error there depending on the size of the move and how uh, how much you've you, you've kind of like cranked it around that could be a half a degree it could be a degree but as soon as you stop within one second it's going to have that uh, that error corrected out See if I'm going to do a demo of that here. No. So this is the other interface for finding that target. You can see you just sort of line it up with the reticle. You can zoom in uh, to get a little bit closer. Um, but the nice thing about the system is once it says that you're on the object, you are on that object. It's not an estimation of it. It's taken a photo of the sky. It's verified that you're pointing at the right place. So if you look in the IPC and you don't see it, it really means that you need to adapt better or you need to use some observing techniques like averted vision and so forth. Um, it lets you really focus on the observing aspect of it rather than the searching or the questioning. Uh, there I went ahead and I logged that object, logged it to a SQLite database so you can see uh, at the end of the evening what you've, uh, what you've recorded. Um, scroll to another object and just sort of repeat that. I think that's probably close to the end of the video. Yep. Uh, so that's a little bit of a walkthrough. Um, one thing that it wasn't shown there, and maybe I can pull it up here in the user guide. Uh, let's see. Um, I wanna see. It will actually show you, yeah, I think I don't have a good photo of that, but um, it will go ahead and show you uh, images of all the catalog objects that you have. So it uses the Palomar Sky Survey uh, on that little screen, that 128 by 128, it will show you a picture of that galaxy or that globular cluster or that, uh, that star, uh, the star field. Um, just looking at questions here. Okay, yeah, lots of great questions here. Is there a way to output to an external screen uh, or larger? Yes, uh, this in the field will act as a wireless access point. You can connect your iPad or your iPhone or similar device to that. Uh, and you can run a software. Uh, there's a couple different flavors. Sky Safari is very popular. It does its own star charting. And once it connects to the Pi Finder, it will update uh, the position that it's showing based on where you're moving the telescope. So for public outreach, that's especially uh, a, good, a nice way to do it. You can have people really looking at where, where they're at in the sky. Uh, thought about separating the screen keyboard from the camera. Um, yes, the camera is going through the CSI port. Um, so it's uh, interface is not, I think it's rated for a uh, hundred centimeters. So you're not gonna get very far. There are extenders that will uh, be active extenders that convert that CSI to another signal and they can go several meters. Um, but one of the keys is just having this really available um, at the eyepiece. Let me see if I have a, a photo of that here. Let's see if we go to 
the GitHub. There you go. So, I mean, it is really designed to sit right alongside, uh, you know, at the top of your telescope when you're looking through this, this eyepiece here. Um, it's available. It dims out after a couple seconds of, of inactivity. Uh, so, yes, some people have thought about um, splitting it, and I, I would be happy to support that. Uh, but this kind of goes back to lessons learned. Um, and this is one of the things that I think was successful pretty early on. I decided that this isn't going to be a science project. Uh, so some open source projects, especially in the astronomy world, uh, that are similar to this, they might let you use any camera you want, or they'll support uh, a bunch of different configurations. That's great, but it means that a lot of people have difficulty actually accomplishing a full build. So having a really defined parts list, having a specific way it fits together, I can be relatively certain that if someone has some basic skills with a, with a soldering iron, they will get this put together and it will be a rewarding experience for them. Um, the software, you know, you burn the software, put it in, you know, assemble the bits, um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, I was surprised at how much can be uh, quite, quite impressive for a screen that size and resolution. Um, yeah, you can get a lot of good uh, detail out of a screen that size, uh, especially, let's see if we get, there you go, um, especially if you're thoughtful about your user interface. And I think there's some uh, improvements that could even be made from, from this. Remote telescopes. Um, so that kind of goes into what may be in the 2024 roadmap. Uh, this was designed very much as a tool that I, I wanted to use. So that means I don't have a motorized telescope. I'm right there at the, at the scope. But a lot of people have asked about integrating this into a more robotic telescope ecosystem. And there's some options for uh, controllers that move telescopes and so forth. So we're working on integrating with some of those solutions. And I think there's probably a solution in the offing where the Pi Finder talks to something like a 3D printer control board uh, and we'll move a telescope that way. Um, Without getting too deep into the weeds, a lot of the, the current systems for telescope control have their own model of the sky. So you end up having a model of the sky that is at your kind of hand controller and is helping you find objects. The, the robotic mount has its own model of the sky and sometimes they don't always correspond. Um, but because the Pi Finder can look at the sky, it requires literally zero setup. You put it on the telescope, turn it on, it'll tell you where you're pointing. Um, all it really needs to get the telescope into a different orientation is just to drive the motors. And so a simple motor controller board, probably talking G code, uh, may serve as the platform for a Pi Finder based uh, sort of remote or robotic uh, telescope system. Cool. Got a couple more minutes. I'm going to blow through the build guide because I think that might be interested, uh, interesting to folks. I will talk about a few things along the way, but feel free to interrupt. Um, you know, let me know uh, what what's of particular interest. So just, just uh, listening to your talk, I, I guess it sounds like um, if you're trying to start an open source project again, you may start with um, actually selling the kit right away. Or what would you? How would you do it differently when you, if you're starting up a new open source project, for example, with hardware and software like you did? Right. You um, right I well, might have. I might have started the Discord first, frankly. Um, like this, all new created around a design that I came up with um, myself. And I think if I would have had collaborators earlier, that would have been great. I don't know if I would have been able to attract anyone's attention without something to show and say, "Hey, you know, I'm serious about this." this is working. It seemed a little weird at first, like people hadn't seen something like this. There was some, definitely some technology questions about how well it would work. Um, but I think if I could have gotten people on board sooner, that first version would have been better. And then every subsequent version would have been building on a slightly better base. Um, and I also would have thought, yeah, about how to make this, 
I, I focused a lot on people building it themselves. And I tried to make the build guide very comprehensive. Uh, you know, there's one set of parts, use this set of parts. You know, I, I tried to pick parts that were easy to source. Um, I'd stick with that, but then I also probably would have thought about bulk buy and kits and, you know, maybe even uh, some other areas of the world that I didn't focus on quite as much and I couldn't find quite the same thing. So there probably would have been slightly different design decisions if I would have been thinking about uh, making this available to a, a wider audience. Um, yeah, so you can see here's the inertial measurement unit. It fits on the back of the board, the screen. Here's another thing. The screen, you need to modify it. So you take these things off and you pull this little connector off. Honestly, there's no reason for that, except that when I built my unit, I wanted it a little bit lower profile. Um, but it's going to be way easier to build if you don't have to hack at the screen. It's not that hard. It's not that dangerous. But there's no reason why those standoffs couldn't be there. We could accommodate them. The screen would just sit a couple millimeters higher. So decisions like that, I think, would have uh, been more obvious. Yeah, got to cut these bits off. So, um, you know, hey, it might not be as flush, might not be as nice, but it'd be way easier to build. And I think that would have been uh, a sacrifice that I would have made uh, earlier on had I known rather than try to backfill and, you know, try to work on those objects, all those things uh, along the way. So you can see how it kind of comes together, standoffs on the pie. There you go, you solder on the headers. Uh, and once you're done with that, everything else is pretty, um, let's see, there we go. It's pretty much just a screwdriver and the 3D printed parts. So here's all the bits. Uh, this is the Pi Sugar battery. That's been kind of a mixed blessing. I don't know if anyone's had any experience with those. Um, they're great because they're compact. Then this like wedges right under the Pi, uh, uses these pogo pins to, to provide power. The battery's ample, and it actually supplies the 5,000 uh, milliamp hours uh, that it, it advertises. Uh, that'll run the Pi Finder four to five hours. Some of that depends on how active you are, because it does go into sleep mode if you just let the telescope sit for a second. Um, so you affix the battery, uh, prepare the camera. These cameras are great, by the way. Uh, a little expensive, but they've just been workhorses. Um, here we go. Here's some bits about the pie sugar that aren't great. If you have this, uh, in the wrong position, it nukes I2C for some weird reason. Uh, yeah, cold nights will affect, uh, the battery power. Lithium, uh, batteries are good to about freezing and then they really go off a cliff. And yeah, uh, we're out there. We're hardy folks. We're, we're below zero, uh, Celsius, not often, but often enough that, I've seen that go down to like one hour of runtime or half an hour of runtime. Um, so it's definitely something you gotta, gotta look out for. Uh, yeah, so here's more of the assembly. Again, try to be really detailed so that people who might not have a lot of confidence with this stuff would be able to uh, you know, put this together themselves, uh, 3D printed parts. And you can see routing the camera cable, getting that connected. Uh, here you can see a little bit about the adjustment of the camera. One of the things you got to do with these devices, any sort of finder type device on a telescope, is you just have to make sure that it's pointing at the same place that your telescope is pointing. Um, technically, the Pi Finder is telling you where it's pointed. And if it's not aligned with your scope, then that's not going to be of much use. But you can use these thumb screws and the preview screen to sort of uh, align that on a bright star. And yep. Yeah just continue on the build here we're introducing that ui module um this is one of the strangely enough uh the largest barrier to entry um i've provided quite a number of these fully assembled i mean i don't 50 of them maybe i've made so far um they're not that hard but that was intimidating to some people once they have that all the rest of it feels comfortable it's a screwdriver it screws um nothing too too crazy there um and you can see if, if you have the pie sugar, you can cut this opening. So that's one of those kind of universal parts. There used to be two, now there's one that serves double purpose. Um, oh, another interesting thing for those 3D printing uh, design nerds. Um, so this can be built, this is the right-handed photos, cameras pointing to the right. Um, but because of these edge inserts, I don't know if we have a good photo of them. 
Uh, yeah, so because of these inserts in the edge of the pieces, a lot of these pieces can be mirrored or flipped. So this can be built left-handed or right-handed, exact same 3D printed parts. Uh, that was a great suggestion from one of the early contributors to put these on the edge. Um, it's handy. I'm going to start using that in all of my uh, my builds from now on, I think, because it really um, is a cool trick. Uh, but that's how you can see that, you know, this screws into the base plate. This is going into some edge inserts into this bit. Um, don't need to crank any of this down because it's got a lot of uh, structural interlocking pieces. Um, and it ultimately ends up if you've done everything right with this nice uh, working pie finder. Uh, <laughs> minimum DPI for the camera for it to work. Okay, great question. Uh, so the, the high quality camera is a great camera. It can do great things. Um, I feel bad uh, writing software for it that bins it down to 512. So it's taking a 512 by 512 image. That's kind of optimum for the solving algorithm. Uh, it picks out stars out of that. It solves it fairly quickly. Um, the next version is probably going to go for a more sensitive but lower resolution camera based on what I've learned, something like 1024. Uh, I'll still bin that probably down to 512. Uh, but I rather have more larger pixels or sensitive sort of photo buckets uh, with fewer of them on, on the sensor ultimately. Uh, it is using a CC uh, TV lens. They're pretty easy to get to. Um, I don't have any photos there. It's probably not great. Um, uh, here's all the parts, 3D printed parts uh, for the two different configurations. Uh, here's those edge inserts. <clears throat> you can kind of see them, them there. Um, yeah, a little bit about mounting it. Uh, this universal mount was kind of nice because Telescopes have uh, mounting kind of hard points, various uh, areas. So having something universal here uh, really saved me a lot of time. I used to ask people and custom print 20 degrees and 15 degrees and, you know, uh, seven degrees. So this was, <clears throat> again, one of those things that I would have thought of much earlier if I would have envisioned supporting people building these things in, in volume. <clears throat> what, what Any other... Here? What about processing power? Does it, do you find that the four is plenty of processing power? Or, and what kind of four do you use? Do you use a, a gigabyte or what's the? Uh, so it's a uh, two gigabyte works well. Um, people have run these with uh, threes uh, with one, one uh, gig and it works. The only thing that suffers is the update speed on the screen as you're moving the telescope. It gets down to like five frames a second, um, but it completely works. Is the four powerful enough? Yes, uh, but I'd like a little bit more. I'd like to get that screen update speed to something like 30 frames a second, um, if possible, just to give it a little bit smoother experience. And there's some people I've taken a run at uh, optimizing that code. There's someone else who uh, is interested in, in giving that a try. Uh, so maybe we can get, get that a little bit, uh, a little bit faster. Have you considered heat sinking the processor to the battery? Interesting. Uh, no, but there's something related to that. So one issue that you often run into when you're observing in certain environments is uh, condensation on optical elements. And uh, one of the nice side effects of the Raspberry Pi generating quite a bit of heat and being close to the camera lens is that it actually keeps dew off of that lens by just raising its temperature a couple degrees above ambient. Um, that probably also helps the battery, but it's sort of a chicken the egg. If the, if the battery isn't able to power it, then you can't use the battery to heat it. But I'm sure that it's getting some benefit just from being you know so close to the, the Pi. But heat sinking it directly would be interesting. <laughs> um, it's not entirely common, but it's effectively used in electric vehicles, um, using the waste heat from the controller and the motor to heat the batteries when it's cold. Ah. Seems like a reasonable huh. it's waste heat. 
Well, the, the new version that I'm thinking of designing, the more manufacturing uh, friendly version will be fully enclosed. So, um, you know, I might actually have to work on heat rejection more than, than currently uh, I'm thinking about. And so uh, maybe pumping that into the battery pack when appropriate would be an interesting, interesting option. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank great. you. I appreciate the, the great questions and letting me give this presentation. Thanks very much. That was very cool. I really enjoyed that one. It's very, uh, obviously you put a lot of work into it. <laughs> Spending a, a lot of your weekends, I'm sure. Yeah, it's been uh, all encompassing for a bit. <laughs> I like your solution to the backlit keyboard. Um, I might steal that. I mean, I yeah. assume that you're just using a PCB and you're using the substrate to transmit the light. Um, yep. Sh something. Shine through uh, legends have worked out great. Uh, it's interesting. Almost every other order I do, they will check with me because it has, you know, the, the letters properly oriented on the top layer and then they're, they're reversed on the back because they have to match. And they're like, oh, your your lettering is reversed on the back. I'm like, I know. I just just run with it. <laughs> Very clever idea. <laughs>